Alright, good, uh, good morning. Acts chapter 13, part number 5, good morning. I am here solo today. My wife and uh, son are up in North Carolina, so I could not make it uh, up there because of work, but they're coming back today. So It's uh, it's it's weird not having uh, them home. This It's one of the first times I've been away from Noah for more than a couple days. He went to uh, Mexico for about a week, and that was really hard. That was when he was younger, though, and not having him in the house. It's weird. You wake up, you're used to waking up at you know 6 o'clock, and you're not hearing the scream, and you're like, eh, what? what? And so it's just it's a little bit different. So I, I can't say that I didn't enjoy it a little bit. I did. I, I got to sleep in at like 7.15, which is like, that's like amazing. Like 7.15, I wake up, you know, and you're like, Ah, oh, this is this is so nice. I, I don't I don't have to get up so early, so it's good. It's a good thing to good thing to enjoy for a little bit. But I'm I'm excited to have them back. So, Acts chapter number thirteen. If you would uh, turn in your Bibles there, we are going to look today at the false prophet who was a Jew whose name was Bar Jesus. I told you we were going to get to this. We're going to look at this. We kind of jumped around in this book. We talked last week about the exhortation of uh, Saul of Tarsus to those Jews there and how it was very similar to that exhortation and rebuke uh, that, that Peter gave and also the one that Stephen gave in giving them a history lesson. But then at the end, we see this real turning. We see this real shifting away, uh, this, this judging themselves unworthy. The Jews consider themselves unworthy. Paul really is hammering. It was necessary. He's, he's, he's putting them up and saying, this was, this was for you. And you just you just rejected it. It's like somebody comes up and gives you a present, and says, "Here, this is for you. It's got your name on it." And you're like, "Nah, I don't really want it. It's really it's for you. It's an awesome present. I I know it's great. I no, I don't want it. Why don't you want it? All right? I mean, they considered themselves unworthy. They they didn't want it, and they rejected it. So we're going to look today, though, is we're going to look at the opposition that is had in the work of the ministry. <clears throat> The more that you get involved in the ministry, the more opposition you will have. If you don't have any opposition in your ministry, your ministry is probably not very big. <laughs> it's pretty true. The more you discuss the Bible, the more you discuss the Word of God, the more you discuss the Gospel, the more opposition you have. You're not going to have any opposition if you just sit there, right? There's nothing to oppose, right? You haven't said anything that's, that's garnering the opposition. And so what we'll see today is we're going to look at the opposition of the work of the ministry of Saul and Barnabas by a sorcerer. This is like the second guy we've seen, right? Remember the guy back in uh, Acts chapter number 8, Simon the sorcerer? This is the second sorcerer. This is something that happens quite a bit. And what is the purpose of this sorcery? The purpose of the sorcery is to trick and to deceive and to teach people that, hey, look at who I am. Look what I can do. And then ultimately control these individuals. So this guy, this sorcerer, hit a name Bar-Jesus or Elimus, as we'll see. And we must start off by remembering this, that just as Christ has given to us a ministry... Satan himself also has a ministry, right? Satan has a ministry. He's got a ministry. He does stuff. He doesn't just sit there with a little pitchfork and just go, ha, 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 ha. He, he doesn't, that's not what he does. But that's a picture that we get. Where does that come from? Well, let's, let's make Satan a little stuffed animal, right? He has a work, but he also has a objective and the objective of Satan is this, to maintain blindness across all people. That's his goal. That's his goal. To maintain blindness. What does that mean? Everybody's really blind. They all walk around. It's a metaphor, right? Spiritual blindness. That is, they cannot see things from a spiritual perspective. They cannot make spiritual discernments about what is spiritual and what is right, what is wrong, those type of things. Satan is doing a deceptive work and people are buying it every day. Just like Christ has ministers, are we the ministers? Yes. Satan has ministers. Satan has ministers and there are millions of them. Really? Yeah. Millions of ministers of Satan. And of those ones, the majority don't even know it. The majority do not even understand that they are ministers of Satan. They have no clue. They would tell you, I'm a minister of Christ. I'm a minister of the gospel. I'm a minister of God. In fact, they are the exact opposite. They're ministers of Satan. We're not just talking about those who are overtly Satanists, right? What is a Satanist, right? Hail Satan! That's, that's, that's easy, right? Even most people would say, okay, that's weird. We don't want to be hailing Satan, right? No, we're, we're not going to be hailing Satan, okay? 
if you walked into even the most perverse of churches and they started saying hail Satan, they would say, oh, well, no, we're not going to hail Satan, right? They would, they would say that's, that's, not what we, that's not what we do. But we are talking about those who were involved in Satan's religion. Those involved in, as I would say, it's the fleshly attempt to please God. The fleshly attempt to please God by self-effort, by, by works, by, by doing things. Those who have been ultimately deceived. The goal of the sorcerer bar Jesus is the goal of Satan. Read with me in Acts chapter 13 and verse number 6. <clears throat> and when they had gone through the isle into Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was bar Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elimus the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O oh, fool of all subtlety in all mischief, thou child of the devil, Thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? <clears throat> and now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. And now when Paul and his company loose from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. The goal of this sorcerer here in this passage is to prevent belief, is to prevent the exercise of faith, to prevent belief in Christ and promote belief in himself by deceit. <clears throat> God takes this very seriously. It has been said that imitation is the highest form of flattery. To God, imitation is the highest form of blasphemy. Deceit is to make something appear as if it is something that is not, right? That's what deceit is all about. We, we make something that's not really, make it appear as if it is. Deception is very powerful. It is Satan's most crucial weapon. Throughout scripture, we see how Satan does deceive. How does he deceive? Does he just tell lies? Yes, it's one way he does it. But the way he really does it is by imitation. Imitation is how he deceives the world. From the very beginning, the first introduction of, of Satan that we read in the scripture, what do we see? Hath God said? Right? Do we not see deception? There is a reason that Christ says in Revelation chapter number 12. Turn there with me if you would. Revelation chapter number 12. Read in verse number 7, it says this, And there was a war in heaven, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his, his angels. And prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Read that again, which deceiveth the whole world. Probably the most famous of all the scriptures, if we were thinking about them in relation to deception, in the relation of Satan, would probably be 2 Corinthians chapter number 11, right? Turn with me there, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. In Paul's second epistle to those at Corinth, it's filled with some praise. There's still some rebu rebuke in, in the book, don't get me wrong. But as we know from them, they're, they're trying to approve themselves to be clear in, in the matter. And they have a zeal, they have a carefulness, they have a clearing of themselves, they have a new desire. And in chapter number 11, Paul says here in verse number 13, and we'll, we'll, we'll read this and then we'll go back up and tell you where it comes from. Verse 13, he says, For such are false apostles. 
So now what does that mean? If they're a false apostle, does that mean they're still apostles? No. They're acting like apostles. They're acting like it. There's a guy named, uh, oh man, what's his name now? Fin Finney. He is a Navy SEAL. And in his uh, work that he does with Navy SEALs, he's like a Navy SEAL buster. He goes online and finds all these guys who claim to be Navy SEALs. Have you ever seen these videos? Probably the most amazing thing. I sat there and watched like 20 of them the other day. I was like, I'm drawn in. It's amazing to me. He finds these guys who go online. This guy is like, he, I mean, he's, a, he's a legit Navy SEAL. You look at him and he's, he's just like this huge burly dude. You know, he just looks like a Navy SEAL. Uh, he's got the big old beard. He's just like huge. Like, I don't want to mess with that guy. Uh, and so in, this, in the videos, he makes these phone calls. And he says, I want to interview you as a Navy SEAL to these impersonators, these imposters. And so, of course, he knows everything there is to do about SEALs. He actually now runs what they call a Citizen SEAL Academy. So he's come out, he's retired from the SEALs 20 years, 25 years, and he runs a Citizen SEAL Academy, meaning if you want to come and participate, like an extreme, what the Navy SEALs do, I will take you through it all. And, and like, he knows all the stuff. So he goes and he starts talking to these guys. Hey, this is uh, so-and-so. And the guy's like, oh, yeah, good. Good to meet you. Yep, okay. I just want to kind of interview about your time as a Navy SEAL. Oh, what class did you graduate from? And the guys are like, oh, my class? Yeah, that was uh, class uh, 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 33. Well, 33, that would mean that you graduated in 1964. How old were you again? And he's just, I mean, he, nailed, he nails them every time. You watch these people just digging themselves a hole, and they're digging themselves a hole. And you're like, and they just keep going, and they keep going. And they'll do it for 30 or 40 minutes on these phone calls, and the stuff they say. And he goes, so, so what did you say you did again, and what mission was that? Well, we took the ship over, and we did this. What ship were you on? You know, he just asked some questions, and they got no answers, right? But he knows what to look for. So some people, he, he's got the, the, guy, the imposter, they look good. I mean, they got pictures of them in SEAL uniforms. They got pictures of them in training gear. And he goes and asks them, that little badge on the left-hand corner of your shoulder, you fought in, in such and such? And the guy's like, yeah, yeah, I fought there. Well, no, you couldn't. I'm sorry, that's not that one. That was this. You know, he just gets them. <laughs> and so what is it that he knows? See, when it comes to this, this idea of imitation, in this idea of like, you know, this subtlety, he can, he can pick it out. He can see it. He knows it. He just goes, oh, oh, look at that. That guy's an idiot. I got him. I got him. You got him on this one. It's a, you guys got to watch it. Just type in like Navy Seal Buster or something like that is the name of his, his website, whatever. But uh, I want to say it's like Finney or something like that. The guy's last name is. But false apostles try to look like apostles. This guy in, in, in Eliamus, this, this guy here, this sorcerer, he's a false what? False prophet. So what do prophets do? Prophets say that they can see the future. Prophets say they're speaking on the behalf of God, right? And they do that for various reasons. But in this particular instance, he's a false prophet, meaning that what he says doesn't actually come to pass, and he lies. Same thing with the false apostles. And not only that, they're what? Deceitful workers. So if they're false, of course they're false. They're deceitful. And they're doing work. What type of work are they doing? The work of deception. We'll see that in, in 2 Corinthians 3 and 4 in a minute. And they do this process of transformation. Look at it. Transforming themselves into the apostles of Lucifer? No. No, it doesn't say that. Transforming themselves into the apostles of Satan, the apostles of sin, the apostles of Baal? No. Transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. That's the goal. That's the goal. The goal is to look like Jesus Christ. The goal is to talk about Jesus Christ. In verse number 14, I like how it says in no marvel, right? So you're already reading that. You're going, what? What? He really does that? And that's why he says in no marvel for Satan himself, right? No lie, man. I'm telling you the truth, right? As Christ would say, he says it repeatedly, verily, right? Verily, verily, truthfully, truthfully. And no marvel. Don't be surprised at this. Of course this is how he would do it, right? For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Remember we talked about darkness and light? This is what he's trying to do. He's trying to be like light. We're going to look at some verses in the book of Proverbs about, about light and darkness and about the prudent and the wise and how what darkness is, is I like how Job, how, when, when God's talking to Job, Lord responds to Job, and he says, who is this that darkeneth counsel with words without understanding? Speaking words, you ain't got no understanding in what's happening. You're darkening counsel. You're making people stupider. 
That's what it is. To darken counsel. What is it to enlighten counsel? I've said it before. You get the little light bulb. Why do we? Why do those people like you know? Then the cartoons it goes ding and a little light bulb above their head because they see the light. They saw something. Light is the illuminator. Light is the helpful of the path. Look at verse number fifteen. That's why it says, "Therefore, it is no great thing." Right? This is. Don't marvel at this. It's not a great thing. It's not magical. It's not even mystical. He says, "It's no great thing if his ministers, ministers, remember, ministers, guys who are doing ministry." What is the ministry of Satan? To deceive. What is the ministry of Eliamus there? The sorcerer. To deceive. To do what? To prevent belief. If his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of what? Now notice this word here. See, it doesn't say the ministers of, of all debauchery, right? Because that's, that's something that's, you know, we think about sinfulness. Like the, sat the Satanist, right? We're not talking about that. We're talking about the guys who transform themselves into, as it says here, as the ministers of righteousness. And look again at the last part of this with me. Whose end shall be according to their works? Well, if they're the ministers of righteousness, great. Their end will be great. Right? If you read that on face value, you'd think that. Just like if you read in Matthew chapter number 5 and verse number 20 where Christ says, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall not know wise enter the kingdom of heaven. What's he getting at? He's talking about right here that these guys, according to their works, these self-righteous works, are sin. Self-righteous works are sin. See, he says this here, this, this for such are, are, are false apostles, and he says, for such, because of these guys who are glorying, these guys who are robbing the church, meaning that they're taking advantage, that they're doing it for pecuniary gain, he's doing it for those, if you read over in uh, uh, chapter number 11 and verse number uh, 1, I mean, I love this, because this, this issue here is, is an incredibly revealing truth behind the character of Satan. Throughout 2 Corinthians 11, he is reminding them of the subtlety of Satan. Look what he says in 11, verse number 1. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear. What's the fear? By any means. What are the means? The tactics of Satan? How he's going to operate? By any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his overt behavior, through his subtlety, so your... And where's the attack happen? In your mind. That's where it is. That's where the battle is every day. It's in your mind. Your minds should be... I love the word, corrupted. Corrupted. It's corrupt. It's corrupt. In relation to the corrupted, we just read some verses. You know, he would not let us suffer his holy one to see corruption. The corruption there is the is the maggots that are eating the body, right? That's how I think about it. Your mind has got maggots in there. It's all corrupt now. It's gross. I threw some bananas out the other day that were just absolutely the grossest thing I've ever seen. I don't know how they stayed there so long. I was like, man, how long has it been in the house? My wife hasn't been there, so, you know, don't tell her. She'd be so mad at me that I left them sitting there. I'm looking at them like, those are disgusting. They're rotted. They're corrupt. You're not going to eat those things. And that's what happens to your mind. It turns into a black hole of mush. And it's corrupted. And I like how he says it here. It should be corrupted from the, notice the word. From the very difficult Greek that you must all learn and understand in order to grasp the truth that is the word of God. Does it say that? The four years of the master's college you must all attend so that you may be able to adequately prepare for the work of the ministry. I'm being you know, facetious here, but it says from the simplicity that is in Christ. Simplicity is, is simplistic. What's the opposite of simplistic? Difficult. It's simplistic. I'm not making this up. It says from the simplicity that is in Christ. Ever heard it called easy believism? Ever heard that phrase? <coughs> yeah, it's a great phrase. Because <laughs> it's true. Easy believism goes contrary to human nature. Whoa, 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 wait, hold on a second. You're not telling me unless you repent of all your sins, we can go down that path till I'm blue in the face. 
But look what this happens here in verse number four. He says, for if he that cometh preacheth, and notice the words here, okay? It doesn't say, you know, Vishnu, some other god. It says preacheth another Jesus, okay? So they're going to use the name of Jesus to do what they're doing. Whom that we have not preached. So how do you make the comparison? Well, this is different than what Paul has said, right? That's how we know what the truth is versus what the truth is not. Or if you received another spirit, which you have not received, or another, notice that word, another gospel. Paul says, if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, let him be what? Be accursed, right? Which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. What does it mean to be subtle? What does it mean? Think about it. Sneaky. Slight, ever so slight variations. Be as close to the real thing as one can get. That is, that is so delicate, so precise, so as to be almost impossible to analyze and describe any difference at all. I love writing definitions. That's like my favorite thing. I think I would just like to sit there and write definitions. I always just think about, how am I going to define this? That's the, that's the job of a lawyer, right? You're just a walking uh, thesaurus and synonym book. <laughs> Give me 13 words for this. No problem. It's like, you just said that 13 different ways. That's what you got to do. See, subtlety with deceit is a deadly combination for those without knowledge, isn't it? Yeah. Subtlety with deceit is a deadly combination. For Satan's tactics are clever and not obvious to those who are not looking for them. Have you recorded that this passage here, 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15 to somebody? You ever said, look, man, you know, I know, I know you got some issues with religion and whatnot, but let me read you what, how Satan operates today. Have you ever seen their faces? People look at you like, what? Dude, you're, you're speaking weirdo stuff, man. You're talking, you're being unreasonable here, okay? Their faces, if you offend them in saying that it's, at all possible. That there's even a potentiality that Satan could possibly work in the church. That's offensive to them. They get so mad about that. Oh, oh God forbid, I can't believe you'd even say that. You go, what do you mean? Open your eyes. Let me assure you that the majority of churches, and I'll make this clear, are run by Satan. And the ministers of Satan. Offensive? Offended? Probably. You're going to get really mad at me, and I'm sure I'm going to get 3,000 posts on this video saying, how dare you? My church, I'm not saying your church. You need to look at your church and compare it to the contextual you know, authority of Scripture in light of the revelation of the mystery. What, is it? what does it say? Do you preach the gospel clean, clean and clear? They do it unknowingly, though. They really do. They do it unknowingly, and they do it ignorantly. Could you imagine for a second, think about this, the church I went to before was an auditorium that was about $5 million, right? $5 million auditorium. Seats some, I don't know, three to 4,000 people. What do you got? Two days a week it's filled? The other five days a week it's empty? Well, let's bring in the homeless people. Oh, God forbid, you see how dirty they are? They're gonna get the seats all messy. I mean, really, think about it for a second. If you don't see a problem with that, right? That's I had a problem with it. I always thought it with myself. I'm like, how? This church has got a massive auditorium, and it's, it's empty. I remember we used to ride our little scooters and our bikes in the church auditorium. I'm not even kidding you. When I used to clean the auditorium, it would take forever, number one. After communion, it was the worst, because there would be so many little communion cups. You had to go pick up all the communion cups. And then I remember one time I did them all, and my mom was like, you're not using gloves? And I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, you're touching everybody's lips that have been on the communion cups. And I'm like, just picking up the communion cups. That's what I'm supposed to do. So we pick them all up, and we try to stack them really high, and make like lightsabers out of them. And of course, we'd spill them on the ground. We'd have to go get the, the carpet cleaner and whatever. But I'd bring my bike in there after hours, and I'd jump off the, the ride it up the steps. And my dad would probably kill me if he heard that. But he doesn't listen to my sermons anyway, so doesn't hear it. I mean, it's creative editing. Creative editing. You know, 
<laughs> I, I told Frank this was going to be a this is going to be a sermon today. It wasn't. I'm preaching today. This is different than I think the teaching lessons. I, I've been. I've had some issues over the last couple of days that I've been dealing with. But but can you imagine? They don't use it to feed the poor. Five million dollar auditorium. They don't use it to house the home, it's homeless. And you know, ugh. I think that's apostasy, plain and simple, right? Come on. How can you not see it? If you can't already tell, of course, this is a topic that I take, you know, very seriously. And, and it's a topic of great concern because I, I really do strive for knowledge. I want to know. I, I desperately want to know the truth. I desperately want to know if what I believe is accurate, if it's true. And if it's incorrect, then by all means, please come up to me afterwards, send me an email, shoot me some texts. I don't care. Let's talk about it. Let's sit down. You know, there's the thing that's been going on lately is the uh, the ice bucket challenge. Anybody seen this? I'm sure everybody's seen it. You know, <laughs> it's pretty interesting, but if you go through and you look, there's always ulterior motives to everything. Ice bucket challenge, only 7% goes to research. Of that 7%, how much is done by embryonic stem cell research? We can go on to it for hours, but, you know, there's always little things like that, right? You always got to, like, look at it and go, ah, what's the catch here? What's really going on? I'm not saying if you did the ice bucket challenge, you know, you need to go and repent of your sin. That's not what I'm saying. Just look at things. You know, through that whole passage there, this this subtlety, you know, it's it's just this is the way he works. Look at Second Corinthians chapter four for me, okay? In Second Corinthians chapter number four and verse number one, Paul says this. He says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, okay? We have this ministry. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry. So the therefore is what goes on in chapter number three, talking about how, how you know, the, 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 the condemnation that is underneath the law, the ministration of death, and how Israel is still blind to that, how they cannot see what Moses was talking about. They could not see the end of it. And that their minds, as it says in verse number 14, their minds were blinded. And who was it blinded by? As we're going to see, it's blinded by Satan. For unto this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. They go back to the Old Testament, try to explain something that's happening with Christ. It's like, hold on, wait a second, let's, let's get this out here. Let's talk about it. If you read here in verse number one, it says of chapter four, therefore seeing we have this ministry, our ministry is to do what? Is to make sure people aren't blind. That's, that's the goal. It's always offensive to tell somebody they don't know what they're talking about. I don't care where you're at, you know. When somebody says to you, oh, come on, is that really how it works? Like in my job, when I'm doing something, and let's say I, I, I quote out a, a, a new server and network in Iraq and everything, and the client's like, you know, is there any way we can just not use that part? I think to myself, I'm like, how are you even possibly at a position where you're educated to, to say what you need and what you don't need? Didn't you call me in as the expert to tell you what you need, Right? It's like offensive, right? It's offensive to say you don't know what you're talking about. But there's times I entertain it and I listen and I go, okay, let me see. Maybe I've made a mistake. No, and I explain. I educate. And so in my business, you can easily get you know, very offended and say, you're an idiot. I'm not working with you and walk away. Or you can do what I do and I educate the customer. And you know, there's been times where I've educated the customer. The customer says, you know what? Let's just do all of it. I'm like, yeah, that's what we need to do. It might take me an hour to sit down there and educate them, to go over every little piece, and they're asking what I feel are really dumb, stupid questions because I know better. But I bear with, and I say, okay, let me go through this with you, and let me just try to explain a little bit more. And then by the end, I think to myself, was that hour invested worthwhile? Yes, because it may have been a you know, good job we got because of it. And now the client is going to understand, and they're going to trust me. And this is the same thing with the ministry we have in this regard. See, I, I, in my work, I do the same thing. I, my conscience has got to be clean of whatever I do, right? So I want to have a clean conscience in what I do. It's pretty easy to do, you know? So you look here, he says, therefore seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. It's easy to faint in the work of ministry, no doubt. It's tiring when nobody listens. It's tiring when you got 73 people in your uh, Wednesday night Bible study and you have two show up. Just throwing that out there. Anybody can come. It's open. Scott had an excuse. <laughs> Put you underneath the law today. No, I was just kidding. His car broke down. I was going to pick him up. He said he had somebody. But I was like, no, you got to come to study. But hurry up. You got to get here. So it is easy to faint. It's easy to get discouraged in it, right? But look what Paul says in verse 2. He says, but we have, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. 
Not wafting in craftiness. My goal up here is not to make any money. You don't have to give me a dollar. I will sit up here and preach. You have somebody you say, I need the gospel preach to them. I'll come to their house. You can call me pretty much 24-7, and I'll come preach the gospel to them. I will. I think Russ will do the same thing. Frank will do the same thing. Look, this guy, he really needs, he wants to talk to somebody right now. He really wants to believe he's having some issues of doubt. Let's go. Let's set a time. Let's, let's do it. And you'll realize that we're not walking in craftiness. There's, no, there's nothing here, right? This is the building. Look around, right? It's the girls' club. Nor hailing the word of God deceitfully. I think, that, I think it's good that you look less at me and look more at the book, right? Read it more and more and more and more. The thing about putting it up on the screen nowadays whenever I go to the big mega churches, it's like they don't even know where to look for it in their Bible. Oh, it's in there somewhere. But where? When you need it, you're going to need it. But he says, by, by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. It's like, look, you have a conscience, I have a conscience, I'm putting it out there for you. What, is my, what, are, what are my goals here? This big issue here is about glory, right? Are you trying to receive some type of accolade? Are you trying to receive some type of glory? He says, verse number three, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world that's a scary phrase. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them. Again, remember, Satan's going to deceive you with that subtlety, that your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity. The minds of them, which what? Which believe not, lest the, and here's that word, light. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, God should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give light of the, what's the word there? Knowledge. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So all it is is, look, we, ha we possess some information. That's really what we're giving somebody when we give them the gospel, right? Information. The word of God that they place their faith, they place their trust in. And of course, verse 7 says, But we have this treasure in earth and vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. The motivation for the ministry is men's souls. The goal is to unblind minds, to shine a light, to take off the blinders, to uncover the hidden motives of Satan, and pronounce Jesus as pure and simple as can be. The God of this world is very effective at his ministry. Are we effective at ours? Are we prepared to answer questions relating to the scripture? the foundation the church justification the mystery can we say as Acts chapter 13 discusses can we say look at Acts chapter 13 Acts 13 and verse 7 it says which was the deputy of the country Sergius Paulus a prudent man can we say we are prudent Proverbs 14 8 says it is the, is the wisdom of the prudent to understand his way he wants to know what's going on what does the fool do? The fool just walks in his folly and his own deceit. Just does whatever, doesn't care. The goal of the mystery is all, all it's, it's about. Ministry is to renounce dishonesty, no craftiness, the scripture in context, plain and simple. Proverbs fifteen says, Proverbs fourteen fifteen says, The simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his going. How many people sit in the church and are like, well, they're preaching the Bible to me? Yeah. Yeah, they do. And I can do the same thing to you, too, and make tons of money. I've done my Joel Osteen impersonation like 30 times. I'm not going to do it again. I did it the other day for somebody on the phone. The guy was laughing so hard. I'm like, At one time, Grandma makes that apple pie. And then you think to yourself, God has an apple pie for me in heaven. And he just wants to give it to you and cut a slice out. And all you need to do is reach down and grab it. What's hindering you today? Is it, is, it, is it fear? Is it doubt? Let me tell you, good friend, that, that the Bible, God's word loves you. I mean, it's just craziness, right? How easy is it to do that? I mean, you realize he sits there in front of a mirror and does that two times? Two times. Preaches a sermon two times before he ever delivers the sermon. He's good. He's real good. I find myself flipping by the channels every once in a while and go, man, that guy's really good. So usually when I'm in a hotel, because I don't have TV at home. So I'm like flipping through. I'm like, oh, Joe Osteen, I'll watch it, you know? You unfortunately can, you know, 
You cannot just sit in church and just hear every word and go, that sounds great. It's not possible. You can't do it. You got to go back to the source, the scripture, and then understand it in light of context and in light of all of the revelation that we have today. See, in Acts 13, 7, they call Sergius Paulus a prudent man. He's prudent because he demonstrated wisdom in saying, hey, I want to hear what Saul and Barnabas have to say. He's a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. What does Eliamus want to do? Look what he says in verse 8. Baalimus, the sorcerer, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Eliamus does what Satan does. He's an opposer of the prudent. He's an opposer of those who seek wisdom. He does not want them to have understanding. He does not want those who are looking for understanding to look behind the curtain and see the man, see the true operation. He wants to turn him away from the faith. Verse 10, verse 9, it says, Then Saul, who was called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. And look at verse number 10. And said, O oh, fool of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil. Saul calls this man, Eliamus, a child of the devil. And if you a child of your father, then guess what? You're going to possess the same traits your father was. You'll possess that same subtlety, that same deceit. We can go through the verses in John chapter number 8. We don't really have time today. Matthew chapter number 23 says, You're of your father the devil. Right? That's who you are. In, uh, in Matthew 23, he goes on to say, When you make a convert, you make him two more full, full the son of what? The son of hell and yourself. Child of hell than yourself. Wow, that's pretty brutal. Yeah, that's what they're doing. But do they think they're doing the work of God? Romans chapter 2, real quick. And then we'll come back to Acts 13. Look what he says here in Romans chapter number 2. Verse number 17. Behold, thou art called a Jew and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, and that you think as he reads this, yeah, dang straight. <laughs> yeah, I am. And then Paul says, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of truth in the law. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Huh? Thou that preachest the man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest the man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest, abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law through the breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? Wow. Hits him right between the eyes. Remember what subtlety is. Hard to distinguish a difference. But when you put them side by side, when you got Saul of Tarsus, when you got Paul and you got Eliamus next to each other, who's going to win? Who's going who's to be shown as being the truth? Paul calls him an enemy of righteousness, a perverter of the ways of the Lord. See, this isn't just about the magic tricks. This is about any and all who would teach the word of God for gain, out of context, for glory, or claim to be something they are not. This guy claimed to be a prophet. He came to speak on the behalf of God, and just like Simon the sorcerer, he was able to control people with his magic tricks. That's really what they were. They were his magic tricks. Think about it. How was he in the same room as the deputy? Unless he's somebody that has some type of right, authority or some type of control. He's in the room with the deputy. He's not just some little guy. He's, he's this false prophet. He's been doing this for a while. Yeah. And they had to let him in. And that's what Satan goes for more than anything. Those who have the most control and those who have the most influence. You can go back later and look at Acts chapter 9 through 11. It's, it's very similar to what happens here. But in chapter number 11, look what he says here. Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. This is an example of the blindness of Satan being physically revealed. This is who you really are. You're blind. This is a man who claims to be light, a man who claims to be knowledge, a man who, who is trying to demonstrate power no he's got a simple magic trick <clears throat> his intention is to deceive what does God do God uses his power through Paul to blind a man temporarily to produce what to produce that faith 
to produce faith in the deputy. I have so many verses to go over. Just write these down. Ephesians 5.11. Ephesians 6.12 and Colossians 1.13. In Acts chapter 13 and verse number 12, the deputy looked at it and said, Hold on a second. I really like that guy. Why did you do that to him? Now, what does he do? 13 verse 12, he says, And the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Yeah, wouldn't that scare you? Look what it says again in verse number 11. And immediately there fell on him a mist and darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. How, how much is that just like? Helpless. You're helpless. <laughs> you can't do anything. Oh, somebody help me. Help me. Where am I going? What's going on? Done. Done. I mean, that to me is just like, think about if you saw that, right? You're like, all right, this is the guy. This is the real deal right here. This guy over here, he's making stuff up. Let's close with this, Acts chapter 26, verse 16 through 18. Acts chapter 26, verses 16, maybe verse 15, he says, And, he, and I said, unto, Who art thou, Lord? This is Saul giving his account of his, uh, of his uh, conversion on the road to Damascus. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister. Not a minister of what? A minister of darkness. Not a minister after self-righteousness. Not a minister of Satan or of deception or subtlety. But make him a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in which I will appear unto thee. The future revelations. Verse 17, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles until unto I whom now I send thee. Verse 18, to open their eyes. What do you mean? Is their eyes closed? They all just walk around closing their eyes? Is Paul going around and physically opening their eyeballs? No, they got the spiritual blindness that we started with. It's a spiritual blindness. He's going to open their eyes. He's going to turn them from darkness. And he's going to turn them to what? To light. And what is the light? John 1. Jesus Christ, right? Jesus Christ is the light. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Close. He says that they may receive forgiveness of sins. I'm sorry, look at he says, And from the power of who? The power of Satan unto God. So that's how it's working. Satan to God. Satan to God. Satan to God. Is there a struggle that's happening every day? Yep, absolutely. No doubt. Do people see it? Not really. Because everybody thinks they're just actually doing the work of the ministry. They're not. And that's a sad reality. It says that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. We'll look up next week at the in Acts chapter 13. It's the first time that we get Paul in chapter 9, 13 verse 9. He's called Paul. Why is he called Paul there? Right? All of a sudden, he's called Paul, whose name is Paul, right there. And then uh, I want to go through and, and, and show you some of these other verses uh, that, that are going to lead us up into the exhortation that he's going to give. And I want to spend some time through that exhortation and go through, you know, what, what, is, what is the reasoning behind using these? Because obviously in Acts chapter 13, he doesn't give them a complete history lesson, right? There's, there's many things that he skips over. So why is it that he uses these particular events as being the most important or the, or the ones because a lot of them are prophetic and a lot of them are the ones like okay if you don't know you should you should everybody's going to know these ones right these are like the most popular things he doesn't go and one time Gideon and one time you know Samson he doesn't like go through the whole bible why is it that he picks certain things and not others right why is that so we'll go we'll go through that and uh, let's go to prayer